Now BBC One's Stephen Walker reports for Spotlight on the murder of Paul Crimble. Tonight's programme includes scenes which some viewers may find upsetting. In the early hours of Sunday the 20th of June 2004, police received a hysterical 999 call from Jacqueline Crimble. Hello, police emergency. Hello? Hello, caller. Hello, I need the police to fight. Oh, what's wrong? <laughs> There's someone who's going to die from the car, my husband. This is the sister and mother of Jacqueline Crimble, who murdered her husband. The flowers they have brought are for the grave of her victim, Paul. The best way that I can do it now is, in my heart, I believe that justice has been done, done for Paul. He shouldn't be here in the first place. Um, if, if you do the, the crime, you have to be prepared to do the time. But I never ever thought this awful. Never thought this awful. She was good at making up stories, if you like, and, and things like that, and getting herself into trouble that way. But I never thought that I would see the day where, where she would be so, so capable of such a thing. Can you forgive her? No. No, 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 no. <laughs> Definitely not. No, she is lost. I haven't got a sister and they should bring back capital punishment, and that's for her as well. Even for your own sister? Yes. Life for her life. You know, and they say here, life 25 years, that's not life. You know, she should be carried out in a box. I'm sorry, but that's how I feel. <laughs> Even this is your own flesh and blood? Even my own flesh and blood, yet. Hello? Hello, caller? This is the moment that Jacqueline Crimble called police to her house. What what's happened, sorry? Someone's got into your house? And where's your husband? Jacqueline Crimble would tell police that she and her husband were attacked when they arrived home from a night out. She claimed a four-man gang demanded drugs and money and then tied them both up. She said they took her husband away in the family car. She then allegedly raised the alarm by using her tongue to dial 999. Later that morning on Father's Day, the body of Paul Crimble was found in his car in a County Armagh laneway, two miles from his home. He had been beaten, suffocated, and his hands and feet had been bound with cable ties. Last month, Jacqueline Crimble, Paul's wife, was found guilty of his murder. Described as a compulsive liar and a serial adulteress, she and her younger lover, local farmer Roger Ferguson, planned and carried out his killing. Tonight on Spotlight, we will show how this manipulative woman first set about destroying her husband's reputation and then set about killing him. It's a story of sex, jealousy, greed, and ultimately, betrayal. Initially, police investigating Paul Crimble's murder had no reason to doubt his wife's account. A man has been murdered after being abducted from his home in County Armagh in the early hours of this Eight morning. Eight hours after he was abducted from the family home, the man's body was found in his car parked. The killing is still under investigation, way. but the police say so far there's no evidence that it was sectarian. As the murder investigation widened, Jacqueline Crimble became the focus of police inquiries. As 
the first 24 hours uh, passed by, uh, my mind began to cement uh, the fact that she was actually our principal suspect. But one of the things that came forward very clearly uh, from the very outset of the initial house-to-house -house inquiry uh, strategy was that uh, Jacqueline Crimble was involved in an affair, uh, and that that affair had been going on for some time and seemed to be almost an open secret in that particular area. This is the man Jacqueline Crimble had begun an affair with, Roger Ferguson, a local farmer. She met him when she and her family moved to Rich Hill. This is the man they murdered, her husband, Paul Crimble. The Crimbles married in 1992. They were opposites. She was brash and outspoken and had a troubled past. She was forever getting beaten up and that because she telling lies on people and stuff. And there was a few times she had to be brought home from school because she had been beaten up because of the way she was. But she still carried on with her stories and making up lies about people and, you know. Paul was shy and reserved. Jacqueline was his first serious girlfriend. He was that quiet. Didn't speak a lot, but listened plenty. Quite wise. Very, very interested in people. And he was a real good laugh. He used to, you know, make these voices, different nationalities, and had the kids really laughing away. And he made people happy when he was with them. It was an odd mix in a way, because there were, there were nothing alike, personality-wise. You know, Jacqueline would have been very outspoken, very loud. You know, she would have embarrassed Paul at times. You know, you would see Paul sometimes saying, Jacqueline, sort of quiet and down a wee bit, you know, and she would have been very foul-mouthed, which Paul wouldn't have been. She introduced me to him and I thought, whoa, really nice guy, different from the boys that she'd been out with in the past. Say it's down-to-earth guy, you know, and I thought, yeah, he's a good catch, nice guy. Jim McFarland, a friend of Paul's since childhood, thought the Crimble marriage was loveless. I appreciate I wasn't there for the 13 years that they were married, but I was there a lot of the times, and you would certainly witness in that period of time little things like just words between people, people, the, the, the rapport between them, and to me it just didn't seem to exist. She would treat Paul good in front of my mum and dad and myself and other family members, but when someone would come in that was maybe a friend or someone that she'd just first met, a friend of mine or whatever, she would put Paul down and make a little boy out of him, and which I didn't like. <laughs> the police investigation led by Derek Williamson examined the state of the Crimble's marriage and Jacqueline's affair, and he tried to understand what her motive for murder could be. The financial reward uh, was uh, key in Jacqueline Crimble's psyche. Uh, she talked quite a lot about money. She told people, uh, and she told uh, a number of different people, uh, how much Paul Crimble was worth dead. Investigators homed in on the phone that Jacqueline Crimble claimed she used to dial 999 with her tongue. Well, it certainly was suspicious uh, in my mind, uh, and it was something that we sought to investigate further. Uh, in fact, we, we sent the telephone to the Forensic Science Laboratory uh, to have it tested uh, to see whether, in fact, there was saliva uh, on the, the, the uh, push pad uh, of that telephone. And in fact, there was saliva on the telephone, and it was uh, Jacqueline Crimble's saliva. Days after the murder, the police at Armagh brought Jacqueline Crimble in for questioning. She wasn't charged and was released from custody. She was freed in time to attend Paul's funeral, where amongst friends and other family members, she had to be comforted as she left the church. During the funeral as well, it was um, like she was sitting in the church and it, again it was just an act because she was sitting bolt upright and looking around to see who was looking at her and then when she realised anybody was looking then she would turn around and start sobbing and stuff but the sobs were switched on and off. Unable to prove that Ferguson and Crimble had committed the murder, the police resorted to secretly recording the couple's conversations. Mm. 
from the very outset, I knew was a very unusual and very challenging investigation. I put in place a strategy to make sure that we garnered whatever possible evidence that we could and we took some very unusual steps in that particular investigation. Some people will find the bugging quite odd. I don't uh, see that as being odd. Uh, my job as an investigator is to garner uh, evidence uh, if that evidence is available and I will use all legal uh, and necessary and proportionate means to do that. The secret recordings confirm that Jacqueline Crimble and Roger Ferguson were continuing their affair after Paul's death. They were often seen in Rich Hill and in this pub in Hamilton's Bourne, the place where they had first met a year before. When she first arrived as a stranger, Jacqueline Crimble had originally stood out, but quickly the locals got to know all about her. She talked about her wealth. She'd come down from uh, Belfast or White Abbey or that part of the world, and that uh, her husband was wealthy, she was wealthy, to buy a bungalow. Um, and down the hoary was just a simple thing as far as she was concerned. That, that in the sky and now we know it was. Roger Ferguson and Jacqueline Crimble became a regular fixture in the pub pool room, but not all of Ferguson's friends took to his new girlfriend. Bobby Cordner was a neighbour and family friend and had known Roger all his life. Like personally speaking, I told him I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't stuck on the gear, you know. And I told Roger that, like, I wasn't stuck on her, like, you know. But it's up to his own business, what he wanted to do, he's a grown man, like. But I told him, like, we'd have nothing to do with her, other than, that's what I said to him. I don't know what promises or what that, that you may have made to Ro Roger, but uh, he seemed to be sucked in, as you were like, into an a abnormal situation, I suppose. And were you able to talk to Roger about her? No, I never talked to Roger about her. I watched, I watched as barmen would do, or publicans would do, that they watched the scene around them, they pick up and they say nothing, they keep going on about their business. One promise Jacqueline Crimble made to Roger Ferguson before Paul's murder was at this car dealership in Dungannon. She wanted to buy her lover a £23,000 4 x 4 and promised the salesman they would be back with cash, presumably part of the proceeds of Paul's life insurance policy. In Rich Hill, Jacqueline had begun working at this care home. The two lovers were clearly planning a future together. But Paul Crimble was becoming suspicious. Why did Paul have suspicions? Um, just because of the way she was getting on and staying out and coming home early in the mornings and he actually said that she was working but as well but um, he didn't see any wage slips and stuff like that. Jacqueline Crimble was telling lies to her workmates too. On one occasion as Paul discovered she left work pretending her child had been in an accident. He actually said that um, her work rang one night and said um, about his son falling down the stairs. But Jacqueline had obviously told that to her work, to get out of work. So obviously she must have been meeting up with Roger. Paul was acutely aware of his wife's affair, but his friends believe he may have turned a blind eye to it to protect their children. Paul actually came over to England with the children and we were sitting having a few beers and he said to me, Nicky, he said, I think Jacqueline's having an affair. And I said, Paul, what makes you think that? And he just was telling me bits and pieces and I turned and said, Paul, I think she is. I said, why don't you follow her one night in your car? And he says, no, I wouldn't do that. I said, well, why not? He said, because if I follow her and she catches me following her, then she'll know that I don't trust her. And that's the type of 
bloke that he was, <laughs> you know. He was always trying to make the best life that he could for himself. And to me, it was just never respected or appreciated. And I, I did have an argument with her one day that why didn't she come back to where, why doesn't she go back to where she came from? And she said to me she'd prefer to be back there. And I said, well, go and give the guy a break. You know, because clearly you don't appreciate anything that he has done for you. You know, and she never ever did, despite me quoting all the things that, that he'd got for her and, and asking her, well, what is it exactly you want? She says, I want a man with money. And that's just the way she said it. I said, well, what is it? What, how much money do you want? Or what is it you're after? And that's all she could just say. You know, she wanted somebody with money, so I don't know what aims or, or w what, what it is that she was exactly looking for. Because she certainly couldn't say things that Paul wasn't providing, because in my opinion he was providing everything, and, and still going on to provide. Days before the murder, Jim and Paul went on a biking tour to Spain and fulfilled a long-held ambition. The, the bike was a good freedom for him because it's something that he could do by himself and probably to some extent get away from her. He should always seem to be jealous that he... Um, that he had friends and stuff that he would go to because I, I know that uh, on occasions if he would want to come up and stay with me on a Friday or Saturday night for a few beers or whatever um, that, you know he always had to arrange it with her and make sure you know, everything was taken care of that he could go out. <laughs> do we dance across the road boy? <laughs> but behind the holiday fun Jim had serious concerns about his friend's marriage. Speaking to Paul and like that a, a few times it was clear that he was with her purely because he had responsibilities of the children and, and there's that many marriage breakups and nowadays that Paul didn't want to be another statistic and thought he would give it his best shot but inevitably he knew that it was going to have to come to the point where he's going to have to build a life for himself you know and, and I know that whenever he talked about leaving her he was very concerned that she would um, she threatened him that he would never see his kids again and with that threat hanging over him but with that Gamble, I don't think Paul was quite prepared to take it until the kids were a bit older. The Spanish trip would be Paul and Jim's last holiday together. <laughs> but Jim's concerns weren't just about his friend's marriage. He was worried about Paul's safety. A month earlier, two men had broken into the family home as Paul was sleeping. One of the intruders was armed with a spade. She says, I thought I was going to be murdered in my bed last night. He says, well, what do you mean you were going to be murdered in your bed? And he said to me, he says, I was asleep in my bed, went to bed early to get up for an early shift in the morning, and Jackie was away to the shops with the kids. And I thought, what, like at 10 o'clock at night? Um, and he said, yeah, she was away with the kids, and he, th he heard somebody in the hallway, and he thought it was her and the kids back. So he rolled over um, in his bed and said, Jackie, is that you? And there was somebody standing over, with, over him with a shovel, and he pulled the sheets up to try and guard himself, and um, shouted at them to get out. And at that point, he heard another guy coming down the hallway, and he, he said to me, it sounded like they were wearing waterproofs, because he could hear the rustling of their trousers. He says, and they turned and looked at each other, and then they ran out of the house. The next day, Jacqueline Crimble gave her work colleagues an extraordinary explanation of what had happened. She said the men who came into her house were after her because she was in the army. Jacqueline Crimble's bizarre lies escalated. She claimed her husband demanded she take part in group sex and claimed he gave her a sexually transmitted disease. But the most destructive lie was reserved for her lover. She told Roger Ferguson that she had been pregnant with his twins, but husband Paul had assaulted her and she had miscarried. This uh, whole vilification of Paul, uh, I believe Roger Ferguson uh, absolutely uh, took uh, on board uh, and it was in his psyche uh, that, that, that this man was a bad man. Uh, he was not only bad to Jacqueline Crimble, but he was bad to the children. Uh, and that this was uh, a bad marriage uh, and for that reason uh, he became uh, spiteful or hateful of Paul and that was his motivation. After Paul returned from Spain, Jacqueline arranged for the children to stay with relatives and she took Paul out for a drink 
which was unusual. I thought it was kind of strange that she had arranged a night out for him because I couldn't tell you the last time I ever recall them going out for a social occasion together and for her to arrange this for him. That night, Jacqueline took Paul to a bar. As they left to come home and walked into the street, their movements were captured by security cameras. This footage would prove to be crucial and help the police understand what happened. This is the CCTV footage we seized from uh, the bar where Jacqueline and Paul had been for their, their, their last, uh, in effect, evening out together. Uh, and that's the last time that Paul Crimble was seen alive. Uh, the CCTV is significant for a number of different reasons. We do know that it was 1.23 a.m. in the morning when they left the bar. Yet the telephone call from Jacqueline Crimble didn't come in until 2.35 a.m. on that morning. And that gave us uh, the indication that there was a, a, a time gap which was never explained. The journey from the bar to the house takes five minutes. So if Jacqueline Crimble's account was true and she and her husband were attacked as they arrived home, then why did it take her around an hour to dial 999 and raise the alarm? What what's happened, sorry? Someone's got into your house. Yes. And where's your husband? There, there's a number of uh, other things that we, we found uh, in the course of the investigation that, that uh, didn't sit comfortably for me. Uh, the principal uh, point about this was the position of the telephone. If the telephone had been on this table, which is overturned, uh, the likelihood that it would land right side up with the receiver in the cradle is uh, negligible. It's just so that added. didn't ring true? No, uh, th there's nothing about this scene really rang true for me. A breakthrough came when police checked Roger Ferguson's phone records. They discovered he'd called Colin Robinson at 2.21, the morning of the murder. Robinson would later admit he'd been at the Crimble home. Colin never has thought that Roger was going to do anything more than confront him. And he never thought that he was going to do anything more than take him to the house. Um, would you consider that naive or just trustworthy? I don't know. The Robinson family have never spoken publicly about Colin's role that night until now. Originally he denied being at the house, but after a series of police interviews admitted that he had accompanied Roger Ferguson to Paul Crimble's home. It was a big fear factor. And I think the young fella was tortured in his mind. He just did not know where to turn, what to do. And I think he, he, he told yeah, he told the lies at the start, and then after a period of time, then I think he decided, look, I am going to have to come clean. And I would say probably it was the burden of everything that he thought, look, I've got to get this off my chest and I've got to tell the truth. And at that stage, then he started to tell the police the truth. Caught between protecting his friend and telling the truth, Colin Robinson eventually confessed. His involvement became more apparent to us uh, when we challenged him uh, on the fact that uh, there was a telephone call between him and Roger Ferguson at 2.21am on the morning of the murder. Uh, and when he was challenged about that, uh, he eventually admitted that he had actually taken part in the events of that night and had assisted Ferguson uh, during the course of that evening and assisted in the disposal of the body. Colin Robinson's testimony helped police piece together the events of that night. Minutes after Paul and Jacqueline left the bar, they made the short journey home. At the house, Roger Ferguson forced his way in, followed by Colin Robinson. There was a struggle and Paul was knocked down. Colin Robinson followed behind and witnessed the attack and saw Jacqueline Crimble kick her husband. He saw Roger Ferguson place cable ties on Paul Crimble's hands. Unnerved, Colin Robinson ran out of the house. He was called back some minutes later by Ferguson and got into the Crimble family car. 
once inside, he realized Paul Crimble's body was on the back seat. He tried to leave, but Ferguson insisted he remained. The car was then taken to a laneway where it was abandoned. The following day, Paul Crimble's body was found two miles from his home. After a four-month trial, Jacqueline Crimble and Roger Ferguson were found guilty of murder. Colin Robinson was found guilty of assisting offenders. The judge told Roger Ferguson, I think you were carried away in the circumstances of this love affair, and said to Jacqueline Crimble, when you failed to take your husband's reputation, you took his life. So it was a challenging investigation. It was a lengthy investigation, and it was a very detailed investigation. Uh, for example, we, we gathered some 900 odd statements during the course of the investigation. Uh, we visited 600 houses, we had 1,200 exhibits, uh, and at the trial we had 300 witnesses. Now, the management of all of that uh, and, the, and the volumes uh, of all of that takes a lot of resources and a lot of time. Uh, I think it's particularly satisfying, not least for the family, that justice has been done. She sat there with a smug look on her face the whole time, a flick in her hair, like she hadn't a worry in the world. You know, and that sort of made everybody angry more than anything else because we just thought, you know, she has some cheek. And it was as if she had convinced herself that she was telling the truth or something, I don't know. She just, it was just very surreal, it was very odd. And it was uh, um, a big relief whenever they said she was guilty. I mean, when, when the jury were coming in, she was sitting rubbing her hands in the dark thinking, this is it, I'm walking. I just thought, how can you be so stupid? You know, the, all that four months of evidence, you know, didn't you hear any of it? You think people are going to get, you're going to get up in the dock for two days and tell a load of lies and people are going to go along with it? No, but it was very good, the, the outcome was good. I think that if she had a shown any sort of remorse, my heart would have felt for her. Like, my heart feels for her a bit, but my heart would have felt for her that there's some feeling in her, there's some humanity in her. She was like a statue, as far as I was concerned. And I found that very unusual. Three years ago, Jacqueline Crimble and Roger Ferguson were planning a new life together. But it was a fantasy world of lies and deception. Later this summer they will have to face reality when they are sentenced for murdering Paul Crimble, a man they first attacked with their words and then killed with their hands.